Haven't the talks been wonderful so far? So if mine falls short, we'll just uh, have a good average. Um, we've been talking about fine-tuning, and in the Christian view of reality, we have God in the world, and God exists all by himself, doesn't need anything to make him exist. The world needs God if it's going to exist. So the world is constantly sustained by God. Now, we would also believe that God created things that have their own causal powers. So when the tides occur, we don't think God's directly doing that. We think he set it up so that created things uh, can influence one another. So God can achieve a lot of what God achieves indirectly through natural causes, using natural causes as instruments. But as Christians, we also believe that God is not only the sustainer of creation, but that he sometimes acts directly within creation. And what I wanna talk about is an objection that is often raised to uh, people who would see gaps in natural explanations as evidence of divine activity. Um, so we're often told, well, there are no God of the gaps to take over at places where science fails. Uh, God cannot be the old God of the gap. God is not in the gaps, but somehow in the whole process. And I am fine with saying that God works through natural causes, but I also want to say that God works uh, directly sometimes. And what I want to examine today is an objection that's often raised about that. So the objection is that gaps in natural explanations, say for example the origin of life, should not be seen as evidence of divine intervention. Um, and the suggestion is that people who would do that, that they're committing a fallacy. Um, and this is often called the fallacy of God of the gaps. Now, when I was writing on this quite a number of years ago, I noticed that although this was a widely uh, mentioned fallacy, it hadn't really been diagnosed as to what kind of fallacy it is. And what it seems to be is that the suggestion is that the God of the gaps commits the fallacy of ignorance. And what you may ask is the fallacy of ignorance. Um, I'm kind of embarrassed by my PowerPoint given just how good the other ones were, but uh, when philosophers get together, the way they do an exciting meeting is they hand out copies of their paper and then they read the paper. So that's how I usually do it. And I'm really worried about being boring. Um, so the fallacy of ignorance uh, and if you want to impress your friends with the Latin, argumentum ad ignorantium, which just means argument from ignorance. Um, and it's committed when somebody says, well, you've not disproven something, therefore you've proven it. So if somebody says, well, you haven't disproven that the raptors will win again, therefore they will, <laughs> that would be the fallacy of ignorance or nobody has proven ghosts don't exist, therefore they must exist. That's a bad form of argument. Well, do people who appeal to gaps in natural explanations as evidence of divine activity, do they commit that fallacy? And I will say no. Why? Well, genuine examples of the fallacy of ignorance are really hard to find in real life. Um, 
I don't know anybody that argues for the existence of ghosts simply on the basis that you haven't proven they, dis- they exist. You haven't disproven they exist, therefore they exist. They might say that, but they will also then give you some positive evidence. Okay? Now, uh, here's a phrase I'd like you to remember. Absence of evidence can be evidence of absence. And you might say, well, what does that mean? Well, I like to watch uh, old westerns. And you have the uh, wagon train, and they're worried about hostiles, and they're all circled around, and you have the newbie, and you have the old scout. And they're listening in the dark. And the newbie says, well, I don't think there are any hostiles out there. We don't hear anything. And what does the old scout say? The old scout says, well, that's precisely why we know they're out there. (laughs) Well, why? Well, if they weren't out there, you'd expect to hear a whole bunch of night sounds from birds and stuff, wouldn't you? So the absence of evidence, when we could expect there to be evidence, is an indication of evidence of absence. Um, And if you think about it, uh, we have arguments uh, that uh, use this in historical research. Um, So for example, suppose you were to, uh, suppose somebody were to say, there was a president of the United States named Alfred E. Newman. Well, wouldn't the absence of any evidence to that be the evidence of there was never such a president? If we could expect there to be evidence of something and there isn't, then we are entitled to say that that thing is not there. Um, This is an example I made up. Um, But, you know, if somebody um, says there's a great Dane in the room, and I look around the room, and I don't see any evidence of a great Dane, am I entitled to think there isn't a great Dane in the room? Yes. Because if there were a great Dane in the room, there'd be evidence for a great Dane being in the room. So the absence of evidence for a Great Dane is evidence that a Great Dane is absent. Are we still communicating okay? Okay. I sometimes ask my students that and they just sit there. And this is a valid argument form. Um, It's one of the most uh, well-known argument forms in logic. Again, a little bit of Latin, it's called modus tollens. Uh, If you say, if X guarantees Y, if that's true, and if it's true you don't have Y, what do you know? That you don't have X. So the valid argument form would be, if Great Dane is in the room, then there would be evidence of Great Dane in the room. There is no evidence of Great Dane in the room, Therefore, no Great Dane in the room. Now, that's what's known as a valid argument. Now, arguments can go wrong in two ways. They can go wrong in terms of having a structure that doesn't preserve truth, or they can have bad content. For example, here's a structure that preserves truth. All poached eggs are handsome. I'm a poached egg. Therefore, I'm handsome. <laughs> now, if it's, true that I am a po- if it's true that all poached eggs are handsome, and if it's true that I'm a poached egg, it has to be true that I'm handsome. So the structure of that argument is fine. It's just the content is garbage. <laughs> I could still be handsome, though. Unfortunately, uh, we all reach an age where we look in the mirror and we realize things aren't going to get any better. 
and some of us reached that <laughs> a long time ago. Um, George looks pretty good for someone as old as he is. Um, I think he's a year younger than I am. We went to uh, Carleton University together. Uh, he was president of InterVarsity at that point, and he had hair down to his waist. So there's nothing wrong with the structure of that argument. What is really at issue is, is it true that if a Great Dane is in the room, then there'd be evidence of a Great Dane in the room? And if that's true, then there's nothing wrong with my argument. So question. Do those who appeal to gaps in natural explanations as evidence for God's uh, intervention, do they do so on the basis of ignorance of how natural causes operate or on the knowledge of how natural causes do operate? So that's our question. If we don't know how natural causes operate, then inferring divine intervention, pretty iffy. It's just an excuse for, in, for, in, for ignorance. If, on the other hand, we do know how natural causes operate, then that's a much different matter. If I get through this in 20 minutes, we'll just have a longer uh, question and answer, okay? So, for example, do Christians believe that God resurrected Jesus because they don't know how dead bodies naturally behave or because they do know how dead bodies naturally behave? Now here I'm separating two questions that we always need to keep separate. One, did the event occur? Two, what is its explanation? Okay, and we can't say, well because I can't give a natural explanation it didn't occur. That would be cheating. Well, I think the answer there is, well, it's precisely because we know how dead bodies do naturally act that we would posit God as directly raising Jesus from the dead, okay? And notice there, I'm not addressing the question of did it happen, I'm assuming that, but if it did happen, what's its best explanation? A natural explanation or a supernatural explanation? Still with me? We're not bored yet? So, people who believe that God maybe directly created the first cell was directly involved, not just instrumentally involved, but directly involved in, say, the origin of life, do they do so because they do not know how natural causes operate or because they do know how natural causes operate. Now, if it's the first, then that's not a good argument. But if we have really good knowledge of how natural causes operate, and increasingly our knowledge makes it difficult to say how natural causes could have done it, then it seems legitimate, at least, to be open to the possibility that there's a non-natural cause acting. Now, if you think about it, if God ever does directly intervene in nature, then there will be gaps in any attempted natural explanation of the event, okay? Uh, take for example, again, I'm not asking the question, did the event occur? I think there are good reasons to say it did, but I'm asking its best explanation. So let's take as an example, Jesus feeding the 5,000, okay? Uh, now, those of you who maybe aren't uh, uh, familiar with that story, the story is that a whole bunch of people have followed Jesus out into the wilderness, wanting to hear him talk. They've stayed too long, and they're gonna be really hungry. They might faint from hunger on the way home. And Jesus says to his disciples, well, let's feed these guys. And the disciples say, that's gonna to be tough. We've got, what, five fishes and two loaves? Or maybe it was two loaves and five fishes, I forget. But Jesus says, don't, don't worry about it, I've got it covered. Just start handing it out. 
And so the account goes, they start handing it out, and they don't run out. So on that occasion, it would seem that we had fish, dead fish, mind you, but fish coming into existence in a different way than fish usually come into existence. Fish usually come into existence through fish sex. <laughs> These fish didn't, okay? Um, now, it would seem, at least I would want to take it seriously, that God was doing in a little way what he did in a big way at creation. There's a little bit of ex nihilo creation going on. Okay? Now, if you picked up one of those fish and you wanted to trace its causal history back, you would come to a point where you can't give a natural causal explanation of how the fish originated. There would be a gap in that attempted explanation. Now, of course, once created, that fish is going to behave like any other fish, any other dead fish. It's going to spoil. Okay? But tracing it back, if you're trying to give an explanation of how that fish came into existence, you're not going to get it in terms of natural causes. There's going to be a gap in your attempted explanation in terms of natural causes. So if God ever does act directly in creation, then there will be gaps in terms of natural explanations. Natural explanations will not be complete. So the question then is whether any particular gap in natural explanation is a result of our ignorance. Do we just not realize the process by which fish come into existence? Or is it a result of divine intervention? Well, uh, let me suggest to you two ways to tell if a gap is a result of divine intervention. One, is the gap in an area where knowledge of how natural causes operate, um, have we an adequate um, search for natural causes? Has it been conducted? Um, so what I'm getting, here, getting at here, um, I write a lot on the topic of miracle. Um, uh, so if you call an event a miracle, that presupposes that you have an understanding of how nature does operate. If we didn't know how women got pregnant, we wouldn't think of Mary uh, being pregnant while still a virgin as a miracle. Okay? So if we're going to see a gap as evidence of divine intervention, we, if we're going to make that case, we have to do so on the basis of saying we have a good handle on how natural causes do in fact operate. So that's the first, that's the first point. The second point is, does the event to be explained bear the marks of agency? Does it occur in the context of a teleological pattern? Um, and what I mean by that is the event has to, in some way, line up with our positive knowledge. We, if we're positing a non-natural cause, the non-natural cause, the other form of causation that we have any knowledge of is the uh, form of agency, acting as an agent, acting to make something happen that would not otherwise happen. Okay? So sometimes you will see intelligent design, for example, lab labeled as a purely negative argument. We just don't have a natural explanation, therefore God did it. Well, that would be the fallacy of ignorance. But that's not how intelligent design theorists argue. They argue that we have positive resemblance to things we know to be um, the product of agency, of intelligent agency. So not only do you have to have uh, a gap that seems to defy any natural explanation, uh, 
you have to have an event that can be legitimately be seen as the result of agency. Okay, um, let me shift gears just a little bit. Um, let me talk a little bit about two bad reasons to deny divine intervention. Um, the first one is theological. There are some people that seem to get really upset at the idea that God would intervene in nature. Um, and they will say, well, God wouldn't do it that way. Okay. The second one, uh, I'm going to get to the reply. <laughs> we get here and I say, you got us. <laughs> we give up. Um, the second is sometimes you'll hear people talk about the progress of science. Well, the fact that we can't explain it now doesn't mean we can't explain it in the future. Hasn't science been really successful in explaining things that used to be inexplicable? So let's take a look at those uh, two. Well, the response to one, very shortly, is who are we to tell God how he must bring something about? I mean, if God wants to do creation progressively, I'm cool with that. It's okay. Whether or not he did, I think would be a matter of empirical research. Um, now, Actually, just to use up a bit more time, because I'm going quickly. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, let me just give you an example of, uh, of the uh, first objection. Uh, this is by Paul Davies. And he says, well, the notion of God is a cosmic magician meddling with matter, moving atoms around and rearranging them is offensive, not only on scientific grounds, but on theological grounds as well. I'm sympathetic to the idea that overall the universe has ingenious and felicitous laws that bring life and indeed intelligence into being, and sentient beings like ourselves can reflect on the significance of it all. But I loathe the idea of a God who interrupts nature, who intervenes at certain stages and manipulates things. It would be a very poor sort of God who created a universe that wasn't right, and then tinkered with it at later stages. So the picture we get of God is, well, God is like that painter that painted himself into a corner, then had to uh, step over the wet paint and wipe those out. That if God, being perfect, was to do anything, he'd have to set it up so it goes right, right from the beginning. Um, I think it was Dr. Behe who mentioned uh, last night, um, and this is an example that comes from uh, William Dembski. We have to be careful of our metaphors. Um, the metaphor there seems to be that we should model creation on the basis of a uh, maintenance-free machine. The better the machine, the less maintenance it takes. Well, that's probably not the appropriate metaphor. Um, for Christians, God wants to interact with the universe. And suppose you make a musical instrument. Do you make that instrument to be played upon? Yeah. So if you think of creation, say along the lines of a musical instrument, why wouldn't God interact with it? Why wouldn't God sometimes act as a primary cause rather than just using natural causes instrumentally? And indeed, we can go a little further with that. Um, I may offend Calvinists in the group, but if we think of uh, people as having free will, then would we not think of God responding to free will directly? Okay, um, now, the progress of science makes certain events harder, not easier to explain, is my response to the second objection. Um, it's true that science has had really great success 
in explaining regularities of nature. So if you want a uh, detailed explanation of the tides, well, you can go to our uh, previous speaker and he will explain to you how intricate, how fine-tuned that has to be. But we also want to explain things that are not just regularly occurring. Life is not just regularly originating. It, you know, you run over a rabbit, uh, there's enough energy in the sun, there's actually all the, a lot of the structures already there made, but you're pretty guaranteed that the rabbit's not gonna come back. Um, so what I would uh, argue here is actually for some phenomena, what we might call historical phenomena, the progress of science actually makes it harder to explain them in terms of natural causes rather than easier. Um, take for example, um, let me refer to miracle and then I'll refer to the origin of life. Take for example, um, Jesus turning water into wine. Again, for the sake of the argument, accept that the event happened. So here we have water turning into wine at the spoken word of Jesus. Now, we know a whole lot more about human physiology than we did 2,000 years ago. And we know a whole lot more about the chemistry of wine than we did 2,000 years ago. Has our increased knowledge made it easier to give a natural explanation of how that could occur? No, it's made it harder. If you think of the resurrection of Jesus, we know a lot more about human physiology. None of that makes it easier to explain how a corpse dead three days would come back to life. Now, if we think then about some, a question like, say, the origin of life, and uh, there are people here far better qualified than I to talk about it, but I think Dr. Behe uh, mentioned last night that in the time of Darwin, the cell was thought of as pretty basic, maybe like a glob of jello. What do we know about it now is it's full not only of machines, but basically of interrelated factories. Our increased knowledge of the first thing that could reproduce itself, and you need that even to get evolution started, our increased knowledge hasn't made it easier to give an explanation in terms of natural causes. It's made it a whole lot harder. Now, um, let me uh, just briefly mention uh, one way of uh, looking at this. We can ask, well, in our knowledge of natural causes, uh, what do we have to do if we're going to say that uh, finding a gap would be, uh, a we could legitimately infer uh, intelligent design or divine intervention? Well. Um, we could ask, how many individuals are conducting the search? Are the individuals competent to conduct the search? Are the individuals conducting the search motivated to find the thing they're looking for? Do the individuals conducting the search have the resources necessary to conduct the search? Have the individuals conducting the search taken the time necessary to conduct a thorough search? Well, do you have people that are really motivated to find a natural explanation for the origin of life? Yeah. Do you have a bunch of them doing it? Yeah. Are they competent to conduct the search? Yeah. Do they have the resources necessary? Yes, they're well funded. And what about the time taken? Well, they've been taking a lot of time. Hasn't made it easier, it's made it harder. So oh, I am ending earlier than I needed to. Um, well, that would be for you to judge. Maybe I needed to. <laughs> <laughs> Conclusion. The routine dismissal of gap arguments as evidence of divine action is unjustified. 
properly formulated gap arguments are based on our scientific knowledge of how nature operates, not on the basis of our ignorance of how nature operates. Why is that important? Um, I'll be making this clear when I give my second talk today, but we give science an incredible uh, amount of prestige. And the suggestion that something is unscientific often in the popular mind means, well, it's not reasonable to believe. So when somebody says, well, you know, appealing to any gaps in natural explanations as, as evidence of divine intervention is unscientific, well, that really, in many people's minds, puts it in the realm, of not a fact, but of subjective opinion. So what I want to argue, and I'll be arguing in the second uh, presentation, is that it's entirely scientific to look at gaps and ask, are they evidence for divine intervention? And I would argue that in many cases, yes, they are. Thank you. <laughs>